It gives me great pleasure to introduce Sean Gallagher, who is the Lillian and Maury Moss Professor of Excellence at the University of Memphis, Department of Philosophy. His areas of research include, that's a long list of research that is perfectly suited, because Sean is actually a key um, advocate, researcher, philosopher of cognitive science in this area, and has done many, many years of research. The book that really um, grabbed me from Sean was uh, how, the, how the Body Shapes the Mind, and um, his participation in so many different kinds of conferences across the world has been um, quite inspiring. Uh, I, I have, this is printed in the, in the um, program, and it's, it's too long to read because it will take up half an hour of Sean's uh, half an hour keynote. So without further ado, Sean, I'd like to introduce you. Thank you very much. I should uh, say thank you, first of all, to uh, Chandi and uh, to the organizers of the conference for inviting me uh, to do the keynote, uh, to do a keynote uh, talk. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to my uh, discussion with Philippa and uh, to everyone else as well. So my topic uh, today is how moving is sometimes thinking. And uh, I'll go to the, the first slide. Okay. So different types of uh, movement can either contribute to thinking or can be considered a form of thinking. This at least is what I, I want to argue. Other people have argued and have provided good evidence to, so that is the case. And some of that I want to review. Uh, so for example, gesture and signing are obvious candidates, and indeed they have been considered an instance of the extended mind. I'll also argue that various other forms of movement, even whole body movement, can scaffold learning and enhance, enable, or even constitute different forms of cognition, such as problem solving. So the next slide. Yeah. Um, we have an outline. Yeah. I'll start by talking uh, a little bit about gesture um, and what may be familiar to uh, many people uh, with respect to some experiments done on gesture in mathematics. Um, I'll then speak a little bit about what I refer to as inactive metaphors, uh, which uh, is, is a way to characterize a certain kind of movement uh, within a simulated environment that uh, facilitates the learning of science concepts. And uh, then I'll turn to uh, the performing arts. I'll talk a bit about marking uh, and blocking and dance as forms of thinking. Uh, but then at the, uh, the end, I want to uh, uh, put some limits on what I'm trying to argue here. And, and I want to uh, say, also, that not all movement is thinking. So hopefully I'll be able to get through uh, these various parts. Next slide. Okay. So I, I want to start with gesture. There, there are some well-known experiments by Susan Golden Meadow on the, the role of gesture in math. And uh, Susan has shown, uh, for example, that if you prevent students, young, young children, from gesturing, um, their, their math ability actually goes down. So if you have uh, young children sit on their hands and they're not allowed to use gestures as they're solving math problems, simple, simple math problems in their head, uh, then in fact uh, they do worse than when they are allowed to gesture. So that chart on the left side of that chart, you see uh, them doing worse than on the right side where they are able to use gesture. Gesture, uh, the next slide, okay. gesture doesn't simply scaffold cognition or lighten the cognitive load, uh, which is something that Gold Meadow suggests. It does, of course, do those things, uh, but I think it's, uh, it does something more. Here, I would follow David McNeil's theoretical formulation, which he calls the thought, language, and system 
He says um, that gesture is part of language. And as Merleau-Ponty put, uh, put it, language, speech, or all, accomplishes thought. The speech accomplishes thought, and the idea is that gesture also accomplishes thought. Gesture as a form of expressive movement is not the expression of a preformed thought. It's integrated with the movements of uh, speech in a way that originates extra-verbal, visual, and motoric meaning. So the kind of meaning you get with the visual and the motoric aspects of gesture supplement the, the verbal uh, meaning that you find in the words that are uttered. The next. Okay. In what McNeil calls, uh, what he calls the growth point, which is the point at which gesture couples with utterance. Gesture is shown to anticipate the utterance. That is, gesture starts just prior to the relevant part of the speech act. It anticipates the, the point it wants to, to uh, emphasize, for example. So, uh, indeed, in, in some cases, gesture outruns one's verbal report contradicting it, but prefiguring what the speaker ultimately said, or what the speaker ultimately comes to, if, for example, they're trying to solve a problem, the gesture might in fact indicate the solution to that, even before they know what the solution is. And then when they come to that solution, that gesture has already prefigured it. So uh, for that reason, I think uh, we should say that gesture is um, part of cognition is, is a kind of cognition, not just a, a kind of communication. It is, of course, something that serves a communicator function. It allows other people to, to see, in a certain way, part of your thinking. Uh, but it also helps you to think through and solve problems. And I think this is uh, very consistent with uh, Clark's extended mind idea. In fact, in his 2008 uh, book, uh, he makes that point, that gesture, citing Susan Golden Meadows' uh, work, gesture is, in a certain way, a kind of cognition. It also, uh, also I think it is uh, uh, consistent with an activist conceptions of sense-making. Uh, and that can, that can be sense-making, just in terms of your own thinking, uh, but it also can be sense-making um, in terms of how you make sense with other people as you communicate with them. So um, if just uh, the next slide then, okay. um, here I want to talk about an active metaphor in science education. If gesture helps to constitute mathematical reasoning, whole body situated movement, movement uh, may contribute to the learning of scientific reasoning. And evidence for this uh, has been uh, shown in experiments that use simulated environment. Uh, as uh, I was part of a research team that uh, conducted this research, and what we did was we designed a simulated space environment where middle school children could interact with planetary bodies, controlling uh, movements of, uh, for example, meteor, using their own bodily movement. So the name of the project was, in fact, Meteor, Meteor um, because uh, the idea was there was a, a metaphorical identification with the, with the planetary body or the meteor. Um, so uh, the, the, this is what we refer to as a kind of inactive metaphor uh, in the sense that we kind of enact the metaphor through our movement, through our action uh, in this particular environment. Here's a picture of the next slide. has a, a picture. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you can see all the details here. Um, in the foreground, you see uh, a child of about 12, I would, I would guess, kind of in midair, jumping. <laughs> because uh, in, in jumping, he's controlling the movement of the meteor that he's trying to uh, ultimately send into planetary orbit around uh, one of the planets in the simulation. He's getting a lot of feedback 
but primarily he's moving his body in order to try to affect uh, what it is that he wants to accomplish. Next slide. Okay. okay. So, um, yeah, Rob uh, Lindgren, uh, Mike Moschel, and uh, a number of other researchers uh, conducted uh, several controlled studies uh, involving over 300 middle school students. We set this simulation up in a, in a museum in Tampa, Florida, and we had uh, middle school classes come to engage with them. Uh, but we, ha we, uh, we conducted experiments in that way, um, and we compared two different conditions. First condition is the weak embodiment condition, where we simply had them sit at a desktop or version of, of the or the program, uh, and allowed them to do uh, what they needed to do by controlling uh, the mouse movements on the computer screen just simply moving their hand slightly in order to do what they needed to do. That's the weak embodiment condition. In the strong embodiment condition, uh, we allow them to enter into the simulated environment and engage with it in a kind of full body, full immersion in the simulation. The next slide okay. uh, gives you a sense of what we, uh, you know, without many details, but gives you a sense of, of what we discovered. We were able to show that strong the strong embodiment condition resulted in a better understanding of astronomy concepts. Uh, and this was evidenced uh, uh, by, demonstrated by the production of more dynamical diagrams by the students, less, less reliance on surface background features of the simulation, improved scientific reasoning on tests, and dispositional learning. They reported, um, for example, that they really now enjoyed learning science. OK, so um, I think uh, in, in these first uh, instances, uh, both gesture and a kind of full body uh, engagement uh, with one's environment can be see seen as a kind of Generally speaking, a kind of thinking, uh, as we engage in problem solving, we can also think of it in terms of, of memory and such things. Um, going to the next part, the next slide, uh, I want to say a little bit uh, about uh, the performing arts and, and certain techniques that are used. Uh, for example, dance. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with the practice of marking, which is a form of abbreviated gesturing uh, used in dance rehearsal. Sometimes it's uh, merely a kind of a set of hand gestures, where the hand gestures will represent uh, the particular movements of the dance that they will be performing. So it's a form of perspective planning or strategizing. Um, here's uh, Warbarton, uh, who says, when marking, the dancer often does not leave the floor and may substitute hand gestures for movement. One common example is using a finger rotation to represent a turn while not actually turning the whole body. On the next slide, oops. The video is playing. See a video yeah. of... Uh, Okay, it's done. The, the gestures that she's showing is, in fact, an instant of, of marking. Uh, she's sort of setting out in, a, in, a, in her gestures the, the various movements that she will make. Um, the next slide, then. Okay. David Kirsch uh, has, uh, in fact, studied marking in detail. So you left off okay. with marking improves performance, memory technique, timing more than full out practice or in the head simulation. Kirsch. Okay. Okay, so then if we go to the next slide then. All right. Here we go. Warburton. So Warburton and David Kirsch think of, of this movement in the uh, as as movement in the abstract. 
So, so this marking is sort of a, an abstraction of the actual dance, uh, they want to say. Uh, but I think that the gestures may meet some constraints of the physical environment, since one has to imagine and, in a sense, gesture the dance, not in thin air, but anchored or staged in relation to what will be specific affordances uh, during the actual performance. So the next slide, uh, I want to start talking about blocking. This is a, a technique uh, used in theatrical acting. Uh, in the theater, blocking includes the design of the performance space, the placing and movement of objects or props, and especially the movement and positioning of actors for a particular scene. Next. Okay. Blocking uh, goes back to a practice by Sir William Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan fame, who created scale models of the stage and used blocks to represent the actors, hence the name blocking. Next. Okay. Its major function uh, is to ensure that things and actors are positioned properly uh, from the audience's perspective so that they can see what's going on. This is an important task that the director has in order to make sure that the audience uh, gets the meaning uh, message from, from the play. Uh, and spacing uh, and on the stage is an important aspect of that. Next. Okay. So from the director's perspective, blocking can affect the specific meaning of a scene. And from the actor's perspective, blocking has an additional function not usually discussed in the textbooks. Next. Although it might seem from the outside that for the actor, blocking is just a set of instructions about negotiating the stage. In fact, it not only puts the actor in the right place at the right time, it facilitates the memorization of lines. And of her knowing what to do on stage. So it gives her a kind of knowledge. It gives her um, a way to ease into the lines uh, that uh, she will have to say when she gets to that point. Next. Okay. Being put in the right place at the right time means that she is put in front of another person or next to a significant object, or within reaching distance of a particular prop, and so forth. This lets her know what needs to be done and what needs to be said then and there. So at the very least, this is a kind of cognitive scaffold. On the extended mind view, much like gesture, the movement accomplishes thought. And taking up of positions in blocking just is a process of remembering one's lines. Next. It's not just that I move to position um, X on the stage, and that that allows me to recall lines. Moving to X puts me into those lines. And the lines come to life in the movement and the setting. Moreover, I think blocking is not just about something that happens on the stage. More generally, as we know, all the world's a state. The architectural structures, the spatial arrangements, normative structures of every day or specialized practices, and various institutions make us move and make us think in certain ways. Obviously, there's no director there telling us what to do, uh, but it seems to me that the structure of our, our living uh, spaces um, in a certain way require us to uh, move in certain ways that, that ultimately produce a certain kind of thinking. Next. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, dance. Perhaps with the concepts of marking and blocking it may be easier to see why some dancers 
and dance theorists claim that dancing itself can be a form of thinking. I think uh, Philippa is going to say something similar to this uh, in her talk. Sheets Johnston has, has said that uh, dancing is a form of exploring the world. And Michelle Merritt argues that the dancer does not think first and then move, but that movement just is thought. And thought, in the case of improvisational dance, consists in the movement. So in this regard, movement is meaningful and intelligent. It's a form of sense-making. Next. More specific studies uh, suggest that dance enables embodied thinking, playful, imaginative problem-solving, and aesthetic decision-making. And these, of course, are ways of thinking and talking. Now, I think one way to account for this is to think of dance, especially improvised dance, as a form of affordance explanation, or sorry, uh, affordance exploration, exploring the affordances around us. Dance allows us to experiment with affordances and bodily possibilities, new possibilities for action, by highlighting our kinesthetic, proprioceptive, haptic, auditory, and other forms of perception. It trains attention toward the environment and toward the body and towards other. Attention is something that uh, seems to be uh, embedded or uh, uh, involved in, in this kind of, of movement. Next. Okay. I think this may explain what Cheech Johnston means, uh, improvisational dance as an active exploration of one's own possibilities within the environment. She says, in improvising, I am exploring the world in movement, that is, at the same time that I am moving, I am taking into account the world as it exists for me here and now in this ongoing, ever-expanding present. So the dancer actively creates shape, form, force, while simultaneously perceiving and investigating those shapes and forms and forces. So we can think of improvisation in dance as a playful engagement with the affordances that are drawn from music, the, the environment, and the, the kind of ever-changing form of one's own body. Next. And here's a longish quote from Shamarit. Dance movement is dynamic, ever-shifting, and responsive to context. This dynamism, because it is so intelligent in its responsiveness, seems to require some sort of agent to whom the movement means something. In other words, it would seem wrong to insist that the movement is not merely a biological maintaining of the organism below the conscious radar. The movement means something to the persons enacting it. And we might be might uh, want to talk about this notion of agency here that she thinks is there. Uh, but we'll come back to that uh, later. My, uh, my last point is that not all movement is thinking. Um, so I don't want to move too quickly uh, in, in the direction of simply thinking that any old kind of movement will be kind of thinking. So for example, if we take narrative to be a reflective form of thinking, Peter Goldie uh, calls it uh, narrative thinking about events and action, other people and ourselves, kind of self-reflection. Some theorists make strong claims that bodily movement is itself already a kind of narrative, and therefore a kind of thinking, cognition. You find uh, these kinds of claims uh, in uh, uh, work on body psycho psychotherapy, um, and also in developmental psychology. Next uh, slide, then. Okay. Uh, so under the heading of body psychotherapy, for example, the idea that bodily movement generates narrative leads Chris, uh, Christine Caldwell to define such movements as nonverbal narrative, the body telling its story. 
on its own nonlinear and nonverbal terms. And she explains conscious body movement generates fluid nonverbal narration of self and identity no less important than the verbal stories they tell. Next. Okay. Richard uh, Erskine, also in, in the, the realm of psychotherapy, describes therapy as focusing on the body, the unconscious stories requiring resolution. And he understands the body as keeping a kind of unconscious score of emotion and physiological memory, and as storing experiences of a pre-symbolic, implicit, and relational kind that have never been narrated by conventional means, but for which there is, nevertheless, an emotionally laden story waiting to be told. So Erskine and Caldwell both believe that there's a kind of narrative in the movement itself trying to come out, uh, and, and then the work of the therapist is to, to allow that movement, that, that, meaning, uh, that kind of thinking uh, to come out. Next, uh, with... Uh, Developmental psychology, also, you find some claims that seem very similar. Delafield, Butt, and Trevarthen in a recent paper contend that embodied narratives are part of our lives from very early on and are even implicit in neonatal movement. If this were true, it would lend support to the idea that embodied activity has its own inherent narrative structure. Phil Budd and Trevarthen find the origins of narrative in what they call the innate sensory motor intelligence of a hypermobile human body. The intentional planned movements of the prenatal fetus, a kind of movement continues with postnatal structured movement in which we can identify distal goals and social meaning. Next. Okay. Such movements are further shaped in as they say, early proto-conversations and collaborative play of infants and talk of children and adults. The structure, they claim, in such processes is fourfold. Temporal, uh, in, uh, it's fourfold and temporal, uh, involving, for example, introduction, development, climax, and resolution, which they take to be the structure of an era. Next. Arguably, a, a similar fourfold structure is found in semiotic account narrative under different headings, contract, competence, performance, and sanction. And these are stages that are taken to constitute the canonical structure of all narratives in semiotics. Accordingly, as Belfield Butt and Trevarthen put it, the serial organization of single nonverbal actions into complex projects of expressive, explorative sense making become conventional meanings and explanations with propositional narrative power. Next. One problem here, however, is uh, the notion of pan-narrativism. People like Galen Strawson uh, worry about the claim that all of our structured actions have a narrative character. If everything is narrative, for example, making coffee in the morning, if that's a narrative, uh, simply because there is structure or order. And the problem is narrativity becomes trivial, kind of unhelpful and uninformative stipulation about everything. Peter Goldie also uh, says that it's, it's always the case that a narrative is distinct from what it is a narrative of. Next. Uh, and also, narrative theorists also want to uh, safeguard the concept of narrative. So here's David Herman, who says, we need a principled account of what makes a text, discourse, film, or other artifact a narrative. Such an account would help clarify what distinguishes a narrative from an exchange of readings, or recipe for salad dressing, or a railway, uh, railway time period. Next. So I think it's important to get the order of things right. The developmentalists are right that we learn to form linguistic narratives through interactions with others. 
specifically when caregivers elicit accounts of just past accidents and events, and when, as young children around two to three years, uh, we appropriate the narratives of others um, for our own stories, as a number of uh, developmental psychologists have shown. It's also clear that the contours of our narratives are shaped by the structures of the actions and events themselves. Next, uh, I think I'm going to skip this slide. There's, there's a good evidence, basically, that you know, we, learn, we start to learn how to put narratives together uh, as we engage in uh, pretend play and things like that. But I'll move on to the next slide. Okay. Narrative drives. Yeah. So this is, you know, basically the point that I think narrative derives its structure from action. Actions do take time to unfold. They have a beginning, they develop, they accomplish a goal, and they conclude. That's a structure that narratives must reflect. They are going to capture what Bruner calls the landscape of action. That does not mean that actions have a narrative structure, however. I think the derivation goes the other way. Narrative is anchored in a pre-narrative, pre-reflective, non-representational structure. Next. Here is uh, Richard Minari, I think, has, has really put this uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the right way. He says, our embodied experiences are ready to be exploited in a narrative of those experiences. Narratives arise arise directly from the lived experience of the embodied subject, and these narratives can be embellished and reflected upon if we need to find a meaningful form or structure in that sequence of experience. It's not narratives that shape experience or actions, but rather experiences or actions that structure narratives. Experiences and actions are the sequence of events that give structure content to narratives. The temporal ordering, the structure is already there in our lived bodily experience, say, in the movement itself. Next. Okay. It's a separate question, uh, separate question whether narratives can loop around and start to shape our action, uh, as a number of people have, have argued. Uh, explicitly, uh, this can happen. Uh, it can, and explicitly can happen in, like, line in acting, in therapeutic reenactments where an agent enacts a narrative through movement. One question is, uh, though, to what extent might it happen implicitly? As uh, someone like uh, Mara Shuckman would, would say. Uh, but I'll leave that as, a, as an open uh, question uh, and go right to my conclusion. Um, so what I've been trying to argue is that different types of movement can either contribute to, scaffold, or enable thinking, or in some cases can be considered forms that are constitutive of thinking. That would be the stronger. There is also some evidence that gesture, marking, blocking, dance, whole body engagement can scaffold learning and Enhance, enable, or even constitute different forms of cognition, such as problem solving, memory, and reasoning ability. Mention only a little bit of the evidence uh, for that. Uh, but my final point was simply that not all movement is thinking. Uh, and I tried to explain why uh, it is that movement uh, is not necessarily itself a kind of narrative, uh, although narrative might be based upon that. And in that sense, even then, movement is in some way maybe perhaps sometimes scaffolding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you.